Okay, we start with the second talk. So it's a pleasure to introduce Jason Lote, who's going to talk about translators in Lagrangian mean curvature flow. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, thanks to the organizers. I'm one of them uh, for <laughs> giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, no, but it's, seriously, it's always a pleasure to be in, in Rio. Um, uh, it's, it's great. Thank you. And I'm, I'm pleased to have organized this, jointly organized this meeting. So, um, yes, today I want to talk about translators in Lagrangian mean curvature flow. And as you can see, it takes me quite a long time to write down Lagrangian mean curvature flow. And uh, it's going to appear quite a lot. So it's going to be abbreviated from now on to L, M, C, and F. Okay. And um, before I begin and get into the meat of the talk, I should say that the work I'm going to be mainly reporting on is joint with Felix Schultzer and Gabor Zekalahidi. Okay, so um, Please feel free to interrupt me as I go along with questions. I'm happy, happy to answer them. So I'm going to start off with a, this all sounds a bit complicated. I want to start off with something very simple, which is just curves in the plane. OK, so imagine that I have a curve in the plane that looks something like this, say. OK, so here's a curve in the plane. And what I want to do is I want to shorten the length of this curve as quickly as possible. Okay? I want to deform this curve so I make it shorter. And what you would see is that clearly a way to make this shorter, this curve, is to get rid of this little loop here. Right? There's this little loop that I should somehow contract down. So if I try to shorten the curve, then I'll, get, I'll smooth out this part, make it get rid of some of those tentacles, but then I will also create here a point where the flow becomes singular. Okay? I've crunched that loop down. And so that's the sort of thing that I want to generalize. I want to understand singularities in this Lagrangian mean curvature flow and how they're related to what's happening in, in singularities like this one. So what you can ask is, well, what is really happening um, as this flow is progressing? So yes, it's true that this little loop is, is shrinking down, but is there a way to understand how the singularity is modeled? So I want to ask, what is the singularity model? So what does that mean? What does it mean to understand the singularity model? What it means is that I have to zoom in to the region where the curvature is highest and then scale it up. So the bit that's shrinking down, I want to zoom into the part of that bit that's shrinking down where the curvature is biggest. So that's not here, right? Because that's somehow flat looking. It's here where the curvature is the biggest. If I zoom in there and scale it back out, then I claim that what you'll see is the following object. You'll see a curve that looks like this. It's asymptot asymptotic to a pair of parallel straight lines. And it has an overly dramatic name. It's called the Grim Reaper curve. And what is this Grim Reaper curve doing? What is special about this curve? Why did I draw this particular curve? Well, what's happening is that if I try to decrease the length of this curve as quickly as possible, then all it does is 
translate in that direction. Okay? That's what it does. You try to make the length shorter, it just moves to the right. Okay? And so this is an example of a translator. It's a translating solution to this curve shortening flow. Right? A soliton solution. And that's what I want to generalize in, in this talk today. So what I'm looking at is the Lagrangian mean curvature flow. So what does this mean? It means that I'm looking at a one-parameter family of some manifolds of dimension n inside a manifold of dimension 2n, which is Calabi-Yau, using Robert's notation there for the holomorphic volume form. So this is Calabi-Yau. So we just saw that here j is the complex structure, omega is the Kähler form, and this upsilon is the holomorphic volume form. And these Ls, they have to be Lagrangian. So Lagrangian is to say that omega restricted to these Ls is identically zero. Okay. That's the Lagrangian condition. And then how do I want these Lagrangians to evolve? I want them to evolve by the following evolution equation. I want to take the derivative in time of my Lagrangians, and given the name, it's not surprising that it's the mean curvature. It's the mean curvature flow, after all. It's the mean curvature vector. It's a normal vector field along my submanifold. At each time, that's what I want to do. And what's good about this is that this is equal to the negative gradient flow of volume. So I'm trying to decrease the volume of my, my submanifold as quickly as possible. Right? So that's the, it's an analog of this. Here I had a curve that's a one-dimensional object in a two-dimensional space. Now I have an n-dimensional object in a two n-dimensional space, but it's the same evolution equation that I run this gradient flow for the volume, negative gradient flow for the volume, okay? But at this point, you should ask a question. And the question you should ask is, is this even well posed? Because on the one hand, I'm trying to decrease the volume as quickly as possible. On the other hand, I'm trying to keep it Lagrangian. And there's no reason why I should be able to do that in general, right? I'm just trying to decrease the volume quickly. Why should I stay Lagrangian? Lagrangian, as written, doesn't look like it has much to do with the metric. But we know that we're in this calabi setting. There is a strong coupling between the uh, Kähler form and the metric. And indeed, this is well posed. So this was proved. A more general result was proved. But in particular, a result of Smotsik says that this is well posed. And let's be more precise, it's well posed if L is compact, but, uh, but there, are other, there are other cases where you can show it's well posed as well. All right? So indeed it makes sense, okay? The talk can continue because the flow does actually exist. That's good. Now, the, the next thing that's special is, okay, but if you deal with normal vector fields, you're dealing with the normal bundle of submanifold, that's a complicated object. I mean, we're dealing with high codimension, right? That's some rank n vector bundle on my, on my n-dimensional thing. And so this could be very complicated. There could be a lot of information in here. But luckily, well, not luckily, I mean, what's good about this is that in the Lagrangian setting, in this calabi setting, you can write the mean curvature vector in terms of a scalar function. So, so let's just see what this means. So here, this, this theta, theta is a function on LT. Okay, so it's a, sca a scalar function on LT. You can take its gradient. That will give you a tangent vector field. J will then take you to a normal vector field. So this, this makes sense, okay? Now, you, can, you're not, you, you probably can see I left a blank here. And the reason for that is that it's not, in general, a single-valued function, but a multi-valued function, in general. In general. Okay? And this is called the Lagrangian angle.
All right. Any questions on this setup so far? So the, the issue in the multi valueness is that you can add a constant and still have a. So, right, that's right. So, so the, the, the thing that's well defined, so e to the i theta is well defined. So you, you get a well defined functions to the circle. So you can add on 2 pi times an integer to these things. Yeah, that's, that's where the ambiguity lies. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. OK, so, um, so this is the, the flow that I want to study. And the, the, the hope is that this flow can be used, LMCF can be used tackle. So a bit like, as Robert mentioned, the Ricci flow, one might hope that one can use this flow to tackle problems in symplectic geometry or symplectic topology. Also, if, mm. uh, thinking about your example in the curve case, are yep. you implicitly thinking about the fact that L might be immersed rather than immersed? Absolutely. This is completely central to what's going on. Yeah, so very often, if you study mean curvature flow, so without the L, so just regular mean curvature flow of hypersurfaces, you almost always impose embedded all the time because embeddedness is preserved. But here, if you start with a Lagrangian that's embedded, it may not stay embedded along the flow. So because you've got the higher co-dimension, there's no reason. So you have to allow immersed. And so once you do that, then you should really be thinking as your analog the immersed curve case. Of course, an embedded curve will stay embedded but there's just not enough wiggle room. But uh, here, you don't have to stay embedded, so there's no reason why you, you can't impose that as a, as a condition. It's not a sensible condition. But again, Robert very kindly made the point that the key issue when studying any geometric flow is indeed singularities. And what you really have to do it's, it's essential, really, is you need to classify or understand not all singularities, because that's too wild. You don't, you don't need to understand them all, but you need to understand the simplest, or I don't like this word very much, but it gets used a lot, generic uh, singularities, whatever this might mean but the ones that are most likely to occur. And what you can prove is that this, this Grim Reaper curve is exactly of this type. So this is one of the generic singularities for the curve shortening flow, but you can show it can only happen in the immersed case. So the embedded case, this never happens, but in the immersed case, it, it can. Okay, so this is the essential thing that we want to, we want to do is so that means we want to understand these singularity models. So, I mean, this is a, re you, you think of this as a rescaled version. The, the that, are arising by a rescaling. So what is the actual singularity that would, would give rise to this? What would it look like? That's the question, yeah. So that's exactly the point. So we don't know. So that's, that's exactly the result. That, very good. It's like you're a plant in the audience. It's great. <laughs> the, the, the result is going to be, you know, because you could ask, you know, when, when, how can you recognize that such a thing is happening? Like, in this curve case, we know, but in general, we have no idea. And the result is going to say that, um, uh, is going to show that certain singularity models, so as I said, this sort of scaling in procedure, in LMCF have to be translators. So we're going to see that there's going to be uh, situations where a priori it could have been anything, but then we show that it has to be a translating solution. It's the only possibility of what's happening. And, you know, this is the first such result, 
So this idea of recognizing something. So what I'm saying is I'm giving you some singularity model and you can recognize it that it has to be a translator. Okay? This is the first such result for MCF, so let alone anything, for MCF uh, for dimensions bigger than one. So beyond curves, this is the first time we've been able to do something like this. But we're really heavily using the, um, the Lagrangian condition. Okay. So, what these singularity models are is the following. So, a Singularity model is going to be a solution, which I'll still call LT, to LMCF, but now just in flat Euclidean space, because you're zooming in, you throw away all the information about the ambient manifold. You're just zooming in and you can, you're just in flat space in the end which is defined for all negative times. Okay, that's the convention. So they're defined for arbitrarily large negative times. And these are called ancient solutions. That's terminology. And so what I'm saying is that we're going to have a result that says I can classify ancient solutions with a certain property as having to be translating solutions. That's what I'm saying which then in particular actually exist for all time. But, uh, but I don't know that a priori. I only know they exist for negative time. Okay. So before I continue with the result, I want to talk a little bit more about this Lagrangian angle and Lagrangians in CN in general. So the first thing is that what we see is that theta constant, if I take theta constant, those are going to be critical points for the flow. And if L is connected, that's the only possibility, right? That theta is a constant. So that's the minimal Lagrangians, but they're more than that. Theta constant is the same thing as mentioned in the previous lecture. This is the same thing as being special Lagrangian. And as was said, because they're calibrated submanifolds, this means that they are volume minimizing. So a bit like the closed G2 Laplacian flow, you have these critical points, but now they're all absolute minima. They're not, not just any old critical point, they're all minima. Now, if you say that theta is single valued, So in general, it's multi-value, but suppose it's a single, there's a choice of single-valued function, then this is what's called um, zero Maslov. So this is a topological condition. It's saying that a certain cohomology class vanishes on your, on your submanifold. So that's going to pres be preserved along this flow. So if we want to find critical points, we know that they are zero Maslov because they have theta constant. So there's no chance of the flow converging at all unless I start with something zero Maslow. And it, yeah, so sorry. Sure. I mean, if it's simply connected, well, no, we can assume simply connected. Then, of course, it's automatically going to be zero Maslow. Yeah, yeah. No, spheres are interesting. We like those. Lagrangian spheres are interesting, and as you know, they're always immersed, which is always also very interesting. So um, yes, so that's that is a very good case where it's automatic. So there's no condition. So this is a very natural condition from the flow because I said you can't reach a critical point if you don't start with this condition. But also, under some fairly mild assumptions, and it's certainly under generosity assumptions, you can show 
that ancient solutions will be zero Maslov. Somehow the topological information gets thrown away as you do this rescaling procedure in, in many cases. So in, in good cases, this will actually happen if your singularity has, a, has, the, has the type that comes from such a flow. And then the last thing I want to say is that if you have a certain bound on the Lagrangian angle, so if I look at the difference between the sup and the inf, so it's going to look a bit weird, but I'll explain what's going on. So if I know that the difference between the sup and the inf of the Lagrangian angle is strictly less than pi, then this is called almost calibrated. So one motivation for this, I mean, uh, there are many motivations for caring about almost calibrated, but one motivation for this is that it rules out this one, you see, because if I here exactly, I go between, I have a variation of pi. So if I take this and cross it with Rn minus one, I would get a Lagrangian that's not almost calibrated. It's exactly at the boundary. So I can rule this one out as my possible translator if I impose almost calibrated. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's a, that's a very good question. Yeah. So the question was, in the, in, the, in the case of the curve, what does theta mean? So that's right. So if you have a curve like this in the plane, then theta is just the angle that you make with the horizontal. So if you take a tangent to the curve, that's, that's what the Lagrangian angle is. So you can see that in general it's going to be multi-valued because you can just take a circle, right? And then here it's clearly not zero Maslow. And this is a singularity model, right? Because I can... I can it will just shrink down under the course of shuttling flow. It's defined for all negative times, but then, of course, stops at some finite time. But this type of singularity is expected to be non-generic in the Lagrangian mean coacher flow, which is very counterintuitive. If you think about um, mean coacher flow you know, for hypersurfaces, this is one of the generic types of singularity, a shrinking sphere, but this should not be, uh, this should not be the sort of thing that we're thinking about. In, in so since you're allowing things to be immersed, you could always just pass the universal cover, right? Yes. 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 I could. I could do that. That's right. So let me just motivate why almost calibrated before I I go any further. So as I said, it rules out. the Grim Reaper times Rn minus 1. That's already a good thing. But it also appears in many other places. So this, this appears in so-called stability conditions. Um, so these are supposed to, so aiming to give necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of special Lagrangian representatives of your Hamiltonian isotopy class. So this is somehow one of the most obvious ways you can try to use the Lagrangian mean coacher flow is to say, start with a given Lagrangian, deform it, and try to find a special Lagrangian, or not. Right? You'll either find one, you don't find one. But you hope that the flow will detect whether there is a special Lagrangian or not. If there's one, it should find it. And if there isn't, a singularity should form that tells you there is no special Lagrangian. Right? That's, the, that's the game you want to play. And so you need some kind of way to detect that just from the initial condition. You don't want to go through every singularity analysis every time. You just, from the initial condition, you want that. And that's this idea of these stability conditions. So I'll just put some names here. So there's 
the sort of the original work was by Richard Thomas and Yao, and then there's more recent work by by Yang Li on this same same problem. Okay, of trying to trying to find a way to give necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of a special Lagrangian, and almost calibrated keeps coming up as the as a very natural condition in, in this game. That's the hope, yes, exactly. That's the hope, that you would, that there's the bit that actually sort of carries the, the Maslow class. That should be the analog of the, the sphere bit, the circle bit. That just shrinks to a point. You throw that away, and then you continue. That's the, that's the idea. Go for it. The, the, this terminology is related to the fact that this uh, uh, Maslow index for a, a map into the Lagrangian Grassmannian. Yes. And, it, and it, you're, you're just taking the tangent map and yes. the map into the Lagrangian in CN. Yes. And you're exactly, you now you have a related, it's related to the classical uh, Maslow index. In, in yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the map is, yeah, the map is, yes, this e to the i theta thing is exactly parameterizing your Lagrangian, you know, it's like the determinant, say, of that map, and, then, and that's giving you the class. You take d of that, and that's going to give you the class. Exactly. Okay, so, um, yeah, so to, to finally, there's one more thing I should say, that if you have a Lagrangian in Cn, well then, what you know is that omega, the Kähler form, it's exact, right? It's d of something, d of some form. So therefore, let's, let's call this Lagrangian L. Therefore, if I look at this now a one form on L, it's going to be closed, okay? Because omega vanishes. So that's a closed one form on L. And then what we say is that L is exact Lagrangian, if and only if this one form is exact. So it's very similar to the zero Maslow condition in the sense we, there we ask for this d theta, this one form, to be exact. Here we're asking for this one form, this natural closed one form, to be exact. Okay, and this is a you know super important bit of symplectic topology. Exact Lagrangians appear all over the place. Um, so. Uh, for the symplectic geometers around, I don't need to motivate those. But again, this is something that you expect to happen for your singularity models. Again, you expect them to be exact under the kind of conditions we're after. Again, this sort of idea, as you zoom in, you throw away the topology is somehow the idea. Okay, so now the, the one last thing I want to say is how are we going to try to recognize these um, these translators? What is the information that we have about our singularity model that we can possibly gain? So, so this is work of myself with Ben Lambert and Felix Schulze, but it's, but it's very, very close to work of Andre Neves, and it says that if you have L T is a zero Maslow ancient solution to LMCF in CN, then you can look at the behavior of this solution as you go very far back in time. Okay? If I go very far back in time, then and I can do a rescaling procedure. So I can do what's called the blow down procedure. So what this is, is that I take L, I put a lambda to the minus two here and a lambda here. Okay, so this is a parabolic rescaling like this. So T, remember, is negative. And then I can look at what this tends to as T tends to zero, as lambda tends to zero. So if I do this, then I, I could do this for every t, so I'll get some flow at the end right, as I do that. Okay? And this is somehow what the flow looks like very, very far in the past. Right? If I go very, very far back, and this flow will be some kind of like boundary value for this 
ancient solution, right? Some weak notion of the boundary at minus infinity. Do you agree? I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very, very weak information, right? So I'm scaling it down and zo it's going back. I mean, I'm losing a lot of information, but I'm getting something, some kind of first order information. And what we proved is in general, this could be anything, right? Could, could be an ancient, just any old ancient solution. But in fact, it's a union of special Lagrangian cones. So that's what it has to be. So if you, if you go back far enough, that's what you're going to see. You're just going to see a bunch of special Lagrangian cones with different Lagrangian angles, potentially. That's what you... The procedure is actually the origin. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm, I'm going around the origin, yeah. yeah. So, but if you chose a different origin, then see... I throw it away, yeah, yeah. Because I'll, I'll zoom that down so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so I can't tell the difference between, you know, planes that are slightly separated and planes that are actually transverse, right? Because I'll throw that information away. So if I do this, for example, with the Green Reaper curve, what I'll get is just that line twice. Right? That's what I'll get if I do this procedure. You see that, right? If I kind of go back, back, and push it down, right? This is going to go further and further back that way. I squash it down. I'll just get that line twice. Okay. So um, this is what we have: a union of special Lagrangian cones. So that's nice, right? Because, you know, special Lagrangian cones, that's better than, you know, some random solution to the Lagrangian mean curvature flow. That's something we can start to sort of put in as a possible boundary value to our problem. And so that's what we're going to do. So the simplest special Lagrangian cones are planes. Right? That's the simplest possible cone you can come up with, is just a plane. Right? But if I take a single plane, you can show it's a, it's a theorem that says if you have a single plane, then there's no singularity at all. So you can't, you can't have that. You can't have a single plane happening for your singularity. You have to have at least two. Okay? So let's do that. Let's just take two planes. Right? That's what I want. That's the next simplest thing I can think of. Yeah, multiplicity one planes, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good point. When I say a single plane, I mean a single plane with multiplicity one. So when I say two planes, it could be the same plane with multiplicity two, like in that example. Could be. But that we should somehow think is a degenerate situation. If you have two planes that are really the same plane, that you should be able to perturb that away. So the, what we're going to have is we're going to take two planes... Let's call them P1 and P2, such that the intersection of P1 and P2 is L is a line. Okay, so I've got two planes that meet along a line. So why am I not taking the case where the two planes meet at a point? Because that's a different lecture. And I can give that one, but I've given it before. So I'm not going to do that one. So I'm going to take the ones where they meet along a line today. So that's the next simplest. The simplest is clear when they meet at a point, but I've done that one. That's the, but I've done that one. So now I'm going to take the one where they meet along a line, which is the next hardest. Okay. So then, the, and then I should say that if the Lagrangian angles theta 1, theta 2 of P1, P2 satisfy that they're equal to each other, we expect um, the ancient solution, well, in fact, we can prove, we can show, uh, well, no, I should say we expect, sorry. We expect our ancient solution, LT, to be special Lagrangian. So it's not a flow at all, it's just, it just stays where it is. So I'm not going to do that case, so I'm going to assume that the angles are different. And so this is the theorem that uh, we can prove. Are there any questions before I state the theorem? General dimension, yeah. I'm doing this in general dimension. 
in general dimension. I'm not saying, so of course in dimension two, this would be a co-dimension one, but then I'm not saying co-dimension one in higher dimension. It's always a line, okay? It's always a line. And so the theorem is the following. So, uh, no, they're different. One is, one is zero and one is pi. So they're different. They, this, this counts, but this is multiplicity two, though. So I'm asking that these are, they only meet in a line rather than in a whole. Okay, in this case, they, uh, they do meet in a line, but this one gets ruled out because it's not almost calibrated. So this is what I'm going to have. So now I'm looking for dimensions grading to two. So this is, as I said at the start, I'm going to challenge myself again to spell Zakilahidi correctly. Let's see. There we go. I got it. Yeah. All right. So, um, oops. Yeah. So, um, so the theorem is this. So if um, LTN contained in CN, N greater than to 2, is a zero Maslov ancient solution, So there's a technical thing, I'm just going to put it in now, plus almost calibrated, oh, and exact. And it's plus almost calibrated if n is greater than to 3. So we don't need it in dimension 2, but we do need it for dimension greater than to 3, um, such that now the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that when I did this blowdown thing, what I need to do is I choose some sequence of lambdas that go to zero. And then there's some, I'd say, like Askeley type theorem or compactness theorem that says that there's some subsequence that converges. But what I get might depend on the choice of subsequence, right? So it's not true that I know that I get the same union of special Lagrangian cones no matter what sequence of lambdas I take going to zero. And that is like one of the hardest things about this whole subject is that there could be non uniqueness here. Right? So I don't want to claim that there's only one thing, right? That would be, I mean, it's not gonna be easy if I do that, but it's easier if I do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to assume that some blowdown is P1 union P2, P1 and P2 planes, different Lagrangian angles, and their intersection is a line. Okay, so I'm gonna do. And now, then the conclusion is that LT is a translator. So that's the, that's the upshot of this. So if I just give you this somehow linear information in some sense, right, this information at minus infinity going back in time and take this kind of tangent flow, if you like, I sort of scale down, zoom in, I get some first order approximation to the flow at negative infinity, that's actually enough to say that it has to be a translating solution. Okay? So, it, the, the conclusion in particular ends up saying that it agrees with the tangent cone if you were just to fix time and... Yes, that's right. The tangent cone at infinity. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is exactly the same as the, this is the parabolic analog of tangent cone at infinity, but it's a flow. It's not, and, and the flow is always a self-shrinking solution. In fact, you can prove that. That's a consequence of Huskin's monotonicity formula. But what we're saying is actually it's a very simple type of self-shrinker. It's a minimal cone. So it's actually a cone in this. So the flow is actually static. So yeah, so it is, it is actually the tangent cone at minus infinity. You don't need the flowing anymore. Yeah, Enrique, what? The, the relative position? Of the line. The line? The line is the translation direction. The line is the direction in which you translate. The difference in the angles should be the separate, so as I said, you know, when you have these two planes, um, I can't tell whether they are skew from each other or they actually intersect along a line. And what actually happens is that they don't uh, intersect along a line. They only do when you zoom down. They're actually skewed from each other, 
and the amount that they're separated should be the difference in these two angles, in fact. It's related to the difference in these two angles. I mean, we, we can't prove that, but that's the expectation from examples. But in this case, you do actually conclude that, that the answer you get is independent of the choice of sequence in parameters. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. So, well, okay, we know there has to be a translator. We can't say it's the, tra the same translator oh. for every... We know it is a translator, but, but this is the next... Yeah, yeah, it's great. You're like a plant in the audience still. That's great. But that's the next question. You know, is it true that you see the same one? no matter what the sequence? That is a very good question. But, uh, but actually a simpler question is, are there any translators that satisfy these conditions? Right? I mean, just start with a, tra is there any translator that's actually got a blowdown that looks like that? With the, you know, maybe I'm talking about the empty set. That'd be a bit of a downer. And it's not the case. So let me just make some remarks that, so, Dominic Joyce, Ying Ying Li, and Mao Pei Sui constructed exact, almost calibrated translators in CN for all n greater than 2 with such blowdown for any theta one not equal to theta two. So they, there is an example. If you choose any pair like that, different angles, you can find a translator. So, as you said, there's now uh, there's there's a question. You know, is the translator we see? unique, independent of the choice of sequence that we see. So the blowdown is unique, we've proved that, it's actually the same one. So that you know, but you don't know that it's the same translator. You know they all have the same blowdown. So now you're asking, if I fix the blowdown, do I know the translator? That's the question you're asking, okay? And so then the follow-up question, is it the JLT, Joyce Lee Sway, translator. And that's the, the follow-up question. Is there a question? Yeah, so yeah. Um, here it's k greater than equal to 2. If you create such an example in dimension 2 and then just multiply it by... By R. No, no, these are genuinely, these are genuinely not, not product type. Because that one would then meet along something larger dimensional. Right? Right. So, yeah, they would meet along like a two plane or something. So they, they, can't, they can't be of that type. They're, they're genuinely different in, e in each. The construction is the same. I mean, it's, 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 it works for every dimension. It's not different in each dimension. It's the same one, but it works for every n grain to two. And you get, uh, yeah, so, um, so I, I'm not going to say much about this. So, so this is just work in progress, but since I'm amongst friends, I'll tell you. The work in progress suggests that the answer here is yes, in this one. It suggests yes to question one. And question two, again, work in progress. What I can show is that um, the JLT translator is locally unique. So if you, there are, there are no other translators near that one. Okay. So that, that I could show. But that's not, that doesn't prove it, right? That's just saying that there can't be anything close by. There's nothing that looks a bit like JLT, so nearby. Right? But that's, that's what I know. But the hope is that maybe this is, so that gives some hope to suggest that it might be true, but it doesn't prove it. Right? I mean, it's just, some, some evidence to suggest there's, some, there's some, you know, some sort of uniqueness property for JLT is true, but it doesn't mean it's the only one. Okay, Simon, do I have any more time? Or, uh, over five minutes. Over five minutes, okay, but I'll only take five minutes unless that's fine for me. Okay, so um, I just want to say a few words about the proof so, so the, the key ideas in the proof. So, 
So the first one is that um, LT, so we have LT is, is this ancient solution here. It's the one from the, the theorem. If I have LT as given, LT is a translator. Ah, right. Let's, let's set things up so that if CN has coordinates x1 plus iy1 up to xn plus iyn, I want the line to be the xn axis and the planes, the union of planes, they meet along a line, so I'm going to have them contained in yn equals 0. Okay. So that's, I'm going to set things up just to, just to set notation, right? I mean, I could always jiggle things around so that this is true. So then LT is a translator if and only if yn is in the span of 1 and the Lagrangian angle on LT. Okay? This is the first thing that we have to, that I claim. <laughs> There's something I've written that's illegible. I mean, that, that's almost certainly true from the first beginning of this lecture. Your question? Set up so that. Key ideas in proof. I'm not quite sure which bit is illegible. It could be any word. Uh, so span in R, what, what do you mean? One and theta. So I have these two functions, the constant function one, oh, the Lagrangian angle. This is another function on the flow. And I claim that this flow is a translator if and only if this function, restricted to the flow, is in the span of the constants and theta. Is that OK? That's, that's the question. It's the statement. And I'm going to prove this one. So the mean curvature, as I said, was j gradient theta. But on the other hand, it's also, if it's a translator, then it's j gradient of yn. And so now you can see that yn is in a span of 1 and theta. So that's, that's easy. Good. One proof in every lecture, right? There we go. I've done my bit. Um, but this is actually in, not as trivial as it looks because I've reduced the problem of trying to prove that something is a translator to showing this statement, right? That yn is in the span of these two functions. What's good about these functions is that, so as you know, those of you who like minimal surfaces, if you take the coordinate functions on the ambient space, they are harmonic functions on a minimal surface, right? That's one of the fundamental facts about minimal surfaces. You take ambient functions, you restrict them, they become harmonic functions. We now have a flow, the mean curvature flow. What happens here is that the coordinates, so x1 up to yn, these are all solutions of the heat equation along the flow. And so is the constant, and so is the Lagrangian angle. Okay? All of those things are solutions to the heat equation along the flow. Now, you should, of course, be slightly worried because this is not the linear heat equation because uh, there's a T on this side, right? It depends on the submanifold. As the submanifold moves, the operator changes. But Nonetheless, it's, it's the heat equation, okay? And so, what this means is that I'm trying to prove that this solution to the heat equation is in the span of these two solutions to the heat equation. Right? That's my goal. And what you get is that there's a very nice trick which is, the, um, which is inspired by complex analysis and it's called the three, well, it's, I think it's called, is it Hadamard, I think? Three circle lemma. Yeah, Hadamard, right? Um, so yeah, but it, the, now it's because it's higher dimensions, it's often called the three annulus lemma. So as I said, CF uh, complex analysis. So it's te talk, telling you something about the convexity of the modulus of a harmonic, holomorphic function. That's, that's what this thing is about. So this log convexity of the, of, the, of the norm of the holomorphic function. So this thing can be used for the heat equation. So, um, so what we do is we extend work of Kolding and Minikozzi on this. 
And what we show is that you can take this yn and take a limit as lambda goes to zero. That's the lambda from the blowdown, which has now disappeared. But anyway, you can take a limit of this thing and get a solution u um, solution of, now it's the heat equation on the union of planes. And in fact, you can show that it splits, so on each plane. So solutions uj, solution of this. That's what you get, okay? You can take limits of this thing. And this uj grows at most linearly. And then the final step in the argument is, is, is a topological one. So that's, that's the last thing that I will say. There's a topological linking argument which shows that um, the UJ actually grow sublinearly. And now we're just asking about solutions to the heat equation on a plane that we actually know. Once you grow strictly sublinearly, you have to be constant. So that means these UJs are constant on each plane, but that means that you're in the span of this one and theta. Theta takes a different constant value on each plane. Right? So now you've, you've solved the problem. This then means that yn is indeed in the span of one and theta. So that's the, that's the idea. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much.